It is a little-known fact, even among the most learned species of the galaxy, that humans, those peculiar bipedal creatures from the death world they call Earth, are walking, talking, and occasionally exploding containers of noxious gas. This information, now widely distributed across the Galactic Federation, was not always common knowledge. In fact, it was discovered quite by accident, or more precisely, quite by a string of unfortunate accidents. The first incident occurred on the galactic space station Zog, a bustling hub of interstellar trade, diplomacy, and occasional interspecies misunderstandings. The station, with its labyrinthine corridors, pulsating neon lights, and the constant hum of alien languages blending into a cacophony of sound, was home to millions of beings from across the universe. It was a place where the strangest of bedfellows, sometimes literally, could be found, and where the unexpected was simply another day at the office. It was on such an ordinary day that a small delegation of humans arrived on Zog, their mission ostensibly diplomatic, but as with most human endeavors, fueled by a desire for food. Humans, as the galaxy had learned, required sustenance with alarming regularity, and their insistence on eating at least three times a day was a quirk that other species found both amusing and baffling. However, what was not yet known was the true danger that lurked within this seemingly benign ritual. The humans had barely settled into their quarters when the first incident occurred. A technician from the Zogian maintenance crew, a species resembling a cross between a jellyfish and a particularly grumpy cloud, had been working in a ventilation shaft adjacent to the humans' quarters. The technician, whose name was unpronounceable to most species, and thus shortened to Flob, was diligently adjusting the station's oxygen levels when it happened. A low rumble echoed through the ventilation system, followed by a sound that could best be described as a cross between a deflating balloon and a duck being strangled. Flob paused, tentacles twitching in confusion, before the wave of noxious gas hit him. The effect was instantaneous. Flob's normally semi-translucent form turned a sickly shade of green, and he was catapulted from the shaft by the force of his own revulsion, landing in a quivering heap on the station floor. The alarm was raised immediately. Gas leaks on a space station were no laughing matter, and within minutes, the area was sealed off and a full investigation was underway. The humans, blissfully unaware of the chaos they had caused, continued with their meal. Word of the incident spread quickly, and rumors began to circulate. Some said the humans had brought a biological weapon on board, others claimed it was a secret government experiment gone wrong. The truth, however, was far stranger. The investigation, led by the station's chief of science, a being known as Dr. Quibblefarn, an expert in xenobiology and a creature who bore a striking resemblance to a sentient sea cucumber, soon uncovered the source of the gas. It wasn't a malfunction in the station's systems, nor was it an attack. It was, in fact, something far more insidious. It's the humans, Dr. Quibblefarn declared, his voice quivering with a mixture of fear and disbelief. They're emitting it from their post-digestive processes. The room fell silent. The assembled scientists and engineers, representing dozens of species, stared at Dr. Quibblefarn with a mixture of horror and confusion. You mean to say, began General Xorblat, a towering insectoid, being whose exoskeleton gleamed menacingly under the station's lights, that the humans are the source of this deadly gas? Dr. Quibblefarn nodded, his gelatinous form wobbling slightly. Precisely. It seems that after consuming their food, the humans produce this noxious gas as a byproduct and it's highly corrosive. Somehow it has gone undetected until now. Maybe something has changed on the menu, or have they been holding in that deadly noxious gas that can't be good for them? Upon further inspection of the menu, some of the humans had been requesting strange things called bake beans, with boiled eggs, curry sauce chilies and onions on the side. The implications of this discovery were staggering. Humans, it appeared, were not just a danger to themselves, 
which was already well documented, but to any species unfortunate enough to be in their proximity during what they charmingly referred to as mealtime. With the truth now known, the Galactic Federation quickly moved to address the threat. A directive was issued. All contact with humans during their feeding times was to be avoided at all costs. If interaction was absolutely necessary, the use of a level 12 biohazard suit, previously reserved for handling the most dangerous of chemical spills, was mandatory. The suits were quickly distributed across the station. These cumbersome but life-saving devices were designed to withstand the most extreme environmental hazards the galaxy had to offer. The level 12 biohazard suits, while effective, were not without their drawbacks. Designed primarily for dealing with highly corrosive substances and lethal pathogens, they were bulky, restrictive, and most notably completely opaque. Visibility was limited to a small, fog-prone window that offered only a narrow, slightly distorted view of the outside world. Communication was also problematic, as the suits muffled the wearer's voice to a barely audible hum, requiring the use of communication devices that often malfunctioned in the station's electromagnetic interference. Despite these inconveniences, the suits became a necessary part of life on the station. Aliens of all shapes and sizes could be seen waddling through the corridors, their once fluid movements reduced to a series of awkward shuffles. The station, once a place of vibrant if chaotic activity, now resembled a bizarre parade of oversized multicolored blobs. The humans, for their part, were initially perplexed by the sudden change in their host's behavior. They noticed that their alien colleagues began to disappear whenever mealtime approached, only to reappear later, encased in what looked like oversized hazmat suits. The humans, ever the curious species, attempted to inquire about the suits, but their questions were met with vague explanations and hurried excuses. It wasn't long before the humans began to suspect that something was amiss. Their suspicions were confirmed one day when a particularly inquisitive human diplomat by the name of Margaret Maggie O'Hara cornered Dr. Quibblefarn in one of the station's less frequented corridors. Dr. Quibblefarn, Maggie began, her voice tinged with the polite firmness that only a seasoned diplomat could muster. I couldn't help but notice that everyone seems to be avoiding us during mealtimes. And when they do interact with us, they're wearing those ridiculous suits. What's going on? Dr. Quibblefarn, who had been attempting to blend into the wall, a futile exercise given his bright purple hue, sighed deeply. Ms. O'Hara, I assure you it's nothing personal. It's just that, well, there's been a bit of an incident. Maggie raised an eyebrow. An incident? Yes, Dr. Quibblefarn admitted, his voice barely above a whisper. It appears that your species emits a rather dangerous gas after consuming food. Maggie blinked, taken aback. You mean you're all scared of our farts? Dr. Quibblefarn winced at the bluntness of the statement. In essence, yes. The gas produced by your species is highly corrosive to most known alien materials. It's already caused several unfortunate accidents. Maggie stared at him in disbelief before bursting into laughter. You're telling me that the entire station is terrified of a little flatulence. Dr. Quibblefarn's expression remained serious. It's no laughing matter, Miss O'Hara. The gas has the potential to melt through our most advanced alloys. It's a hazard of the highest order. Maggie's laughter subsided as she realized the gravity of the situation. Well, that's unexpected, but surely there's a way to manage this without everyone looking like they're about to handle radioactive waste. Dr. Quibblefarn hesitated. We've been working on a solution, but it's been challenging. Your biology is unique, and our technology is not well suited to contain such a volatile substance. Maggie nodded thoughtfully. I see, but you know, humans are nothing if not resourceful. Maybe we can work together to find a better solution. After all, we don't want to be the reason your station turns into a melted pile of goo. As it turned out, the solution was not found in the high-tech labs of the Galactic Federation, 
but rather in the mess hall of the human quarters. It was there that Maggie O'Hara, along with a team of human engineers and a few brave alien volunteers, conducted a series of experiments to find a less cumbersome way to deal with the human gas problem. The breakthrough came when one of the engineers, a man named Bob Hawkins, suggested a rather unorthodox approach. What if, he proposed, we could neutralize the gas before it ever left our bodies, kind of like an internal scrubber system? The idea was met with skepticism at first, but Maggie, always one to encourage thinking outside the box, urged them to pursue it. After several weeks of trial and error, the team developed a prototype device, a small, implantable filter that could be inserted into the human digestive system. The filter was designed to chemically neutralize the gas before it was expelled, rendering it harmless. While most of the Galactic Federation breathed a collective sigh of relief as the human gas neutralizing device proved successful, not everyone was entirely pleased with this development. Dr. Zixler, a member of the station's scientific community and a being whose species had mastered the art of greed long before they had mastered space travel, saw the situation in a very different light. Dr. Zixler was a relaxian, a species known for their avaricious tendencies and their uncanny ability to see profit where others saw problems. With a body that resembled a cross between a centipede and a cash register, albeit a very sinister one, Zixlaw had spent his career turning the most unlikely of substances into lucrative enterprises. And when he learned about the horrifying effect that human-produced gas had on alien materials, his many eyes gleamed with a mixture of excitement and ambition. You see, the galactic space station Zog had been plagued for years by an infestation of space bugs, tiny, resilient, and incredibly annoying creatures that had thus far resisted every known method of extermination. These bugs, which had a particular fondness for nesting in the station's wiring, had caused untold damage to the station's systems and had become the bane of every engineer's existence. Even the most potent chemical treatments barely phased them, and they seemed immune to the station's pest control measures. But here, thought Dr. Zixler, was the answer to the station's pest problem, and perhaps the key to unimaginable wealth. If the human gas could melt through the station's toughest alloys, surely it could make quick work of the space bugs. The thought of bottling the gas and selling it as the ultimate pest control product set Zixler's mind racing. This was a business opportunity of galactic proportions. The only problem, of course, was that the humans were now being fitted with the gas neutralizing devices, which meant that this potential gold mine would soon dry up before he could even tap into it. Dr. Zixlaw decided that drastic measures were necessary. Late one evening, while most of the station was in its nightly lull, Dr. Zixlaw slithered into the human quarters with a proposal. He had done his research and identified a few humans who might be persuaded to forego the gas-neutralizing implant in exchange for, shall we say, certain incentives. One such human was Frank Frankie Thompson, a low-ranking technician with a reputation for being easily swayed by the promise of quick cash. Zixler found Frankie lounging in the mess hall, idly fiddling with a device that was supposed to be part of the station's life support system. Frankie looked up as Zixler approached, his expression one of mild curiosity mixed with a hint of suspicion. Mr. Thompson... Zixler began, his voice oily and persuasive. I have a proposition for you, one that could make you very, very wealthy. Frankie raised an eyebrow. Oh, yeah? And what's the catch? No catch, Zixler replied, his many eyes glinting. I simply require a small favor. You see, the gas neutralizing device that your people are being fitted with, it's very effective, but it's also a waste of a him valuable resource. Frankie frowned. You talking about our farts? Zixlaw winced at the crudeness of the term, but nodded. Precisely. That gas of yours, Mr. Thompson, has the potential to solve a problem that has plagued this station for years. The space bugs. You know of them, yes? 
Those little bastards that keep shorting out the circuits. Yeah, I know them. Well, Zixler continued, your gas could be the solution. It's lethal to them, far more effective than any of our current methods. I'm proposing that you, and perhaps a few others, refrain from installing the neutralizer. In return, I will pay you handsomely for your contributions. Frankie leaned back in his chair, considering the offer. How much are we talking? Zixlaw's many limbs reached into his satchel, pulling out a small shimmering crystal vial. This, he said, is a rare form of galactic credits, worth more than you'll make in a decade working on this station. And this is just the first payment. Frankie's eyes widened as he eyed the vial. And all I gotta do is keep farting? Zixlaw nodded. Exactly. You'll continue to live your life as normal. I'll collect the gas, bottle it, and sell it as the ultimate space bug deterrent. Everyone wins. Frankie mulled it over for a moment before grinning. You've got yourself a deal, Doc.